I'm here today with David Cheriton, a well-known and well-respected venture capitalist, serial entrepreneur, and inventor. We're talking about his time here at Stanford University and also many of the companies that he's been involved in. David, thank you for your time. You have a long history at Stanford University, particularly in distributed systems. Can you tell me how did you end up here and why did you pick that field to specialize in? Well, I ended up at Stanford because I had an opportunity to come here from Canada and uh, I thought it was a fascinating place to be for a while. I didn't quite expect to last there 36 years as it's turned out. And with distributed systems, uh, I've always been interested in that element of how you build these complex systems and distributed is the ultimate challenge. And I was fortunate that networks became a significant factor in computing uh, at the point I got involved in research. So the beginnings of Ethernet started basically at the same time as I arrived at Stanford. You were an advisor to Sergey Brin and Larry Page, and you ended up being one of the first investors in Google. How did that happen? Well, I met Larry and Sergey because they were PhD students who basically hung out on the same floor as my office and with some of my PhD students and uh, I really got to know them more closely when uh, they came to me for some advice about how to license the technology they developed outside of Stanford and I think that I was known a little bit at that time as somebody who might have some idea about the real world because I was involved with a startup that got bought by Cisco Systems at the time, a company called Granite, so people thought I knew something about business. One of the biggest companies that you've invested in and really changed the world has been VMware. How did you become associated with them and, and with Diane Green? Well, uh, I was uh, involved with hiring Mendel Rosenblum as a professor at Stanford and his wife is Diane Green, actually his girlfriend at the time, and it turned out that Diane is a windsurfer, so I originally met Diane Green because we went windsurfing together down at Chrissy Fields just off the Golden Gate Bridge. Um, so that's how I met her originally, was as a girlfriend. Uh, and then when they started VMware, uh, I didn't realize it was gonna be as disruptive as it was, I hate to admit, but I thought it was cool technology and I thought it was useful. So, uh, and I had confidence in them that they would produce a good product. So I thought it was a good investment. You were co-founder and chief scientist of Arista. How did that happen? Well, Arista has a kind of an interesting history because originally we founded the company to do quite something quite different, but uh, I didn't have to attribute it to Andy that we sort of redirected the company into the sort of data center networking space in effect with 10 gigabit ethernet. And I think the, the opportunity that we realized there was that there was gonna be a huge growth in data center networking. They needed much higher performance networking and they needed different feature profile than what was available in the standard kind of enterprise networking. And then there was commercial silicon, as it's called, uh, that uh, switch chips, which meant we could build a networking company without having to build ASICs, which was attractive. And from my standpoint, I think there was an opportunity to do much better software than what I had seen previously uh, for running on switches. And so I thought there was value there. As you look back on those early investments and projects, what are you most proud of? Well, I think the, the thing that I've enjoyed the most is all the people I've worked with. And uh, I feel uh, one of the things I really love about computing is there's a lot of intelligent, hardworking people that are passionate about the technology. And it's just very exciting to build a team where you you pull off something that you realize no individual could do by themselves, but you've, you've done together. And so I think I, I personally get a lot of enjoyment out of that. I think the other element is that, uh, of course, besides myself, I think a lot of people have, have really benefited in their career and their financial situation and the companies I've been involved with. And it's just nice to see people you know, having a better life as a result of companies that I've had some role in pulling together. As an inventor, you've become well known for your work on transactional memory. How is that work going and why is that so important? 
the work on transactional memory is something I'm engaged with at Stanford, and uh, it's, I think it's a, really a transformational sort of approach to how we build computer systems. Uh, the, the model is very simple for the application software. The challenge is making it go fast enough, and I think the tricky part is that it's not purely a software solution you need to come up with, it's a hardware and software solution to make the, the two work together effectively to make it efficient enough. Let's talk about Abstra. Tell me about the problems that it's going to solve and why they're so important. I think Abstra is tackling a really fundamental problem here, which is that I think of this as the operating system problem. How do you operate complex computer-based systems? And the answer can't be manually. <laughs> uh, it just doesn't work. Things are happening too quickly. Things are too complicated. It's too hard to figure out what's going on in the right period of time. So it has to be automated. And uh, Abstra is tackling exactly that problem with data center networks, automating the management of these networks. And management isn't, uh, is a key functionality. It's, to me, management is detecting when things are going off the rails and correcting the situation before they come completely off the rails. And uh, I think that that's going to be absolutely critical because you know, you find in Google or Amazon or Facebook, if an individual server fails, you don't notice it. If the network has a problem, <laughs> everybody notices it. It's absolutely foundational to every company that's doing any kind of IT. So I think we need to automate this to achieve the reliability that we need to build the next generation of applications. You decided to fund Apsha personally instead of raising venture money. Why did you do that? I feel like I'm a little bit caught on that one because, uh, you know, when the VCs know I can afford to fund it, <laughs> they might ask, why don't you fund it yourself, I guess. Uh, but I think that, uh, you know, there's, uh, I think I'm more interested in building really good companies with really good technology and something I think I learned from Andy Bechtelsheim is it's great to build a really, really good product so it kind of sells itself and that takes a little bit more time, a little bit more patience, whereas, you know, venture funding is driven by sort of a tighter time schedule of, of um, needing to achieve return on investment for their investors and the funds. So it gives you a little bit more freedom to, to do it in the way you think is really right. Long term, what do you see as the outcome for Abstra? Do you see it growing to a bigger and bigger company, or do you see it being acquired by a larger company like Cisco, Juniper, or Dell EMC? I think Abstra could grow to be a, a very significant networking company because it's really uh, becomes the operating system for the data center network, and in that context, you have switches or just devices that plug into it, just like device drivers in a, in a conventional operating system. And uh, it also becomes a foundation for automating the rest of the data center. And there's a lot of areas of automation that are required at the server level, at the application level. And what's critical for that automation is to be able to have insights into and control of the network. So I think we're in a great position to grow in, the, in that sense, to become the data center operating system. The Internet of Things is exploding with more and more devices on every possible network. What are we doing about it? How big a problem is this? Well, I think the growth of IoT is going to make put pr tremendous pressure on the networks because uh, you're collecting data and you're controlling these devices over the network. It's going to put pressure on having the networks that much more fault tolerant as well and, and highly available. And, and I think that uh, the technology we have at the sort of basic level of what's often called speeds and feeds is enabling incredible growth here. So I think that the real limit of the technology, again, is how solid can we build applications on top of this and how solidly can we run the communication that is the networking. So again, I think it ties back to the Abstra opportunity. We need to automate these systems to run with the reliability and the, avail and the flexibility that's required for new applications that are all part of the IoT umbrella. You've had a tremendously successful career. 
why aren't you just lying at a beach somewhere or spending all your time windsurfing? Well, I don't windsurf all the time because I only usually last an hour or two out in the water because I you know, usually like to go out in fairly challenging conditions. But perhaps more seriously, I you know, worked for all these years to get as good as I am with software, with distributed systems, and I think there's still some amazing technical challenges. So as much as I enjoy sitting on the beach or windsurfing, I find the, the technical challenges are the things that uh, excite me and get me up in the morning, and the valley is a great place to explore these things, both Stanford and in various startup companies. David, thank you for your time. It's been a real pleasure. Well, thank you for the questions. I enjoyed answering them.